So I want to say good afternoon to everybody and welcome to our third annual Ability Awareness event. My name is Marcy Daniels and I'm the Director of Services to Students with Disabilities and Workability 4. I have the distinct honor of introducing one of CSUSB's most notable scholars. Dr. Jeremy Murray is an associate professor in the history department. He is an expert on the history of modern China as viewed from the cultural, political, and social margins. His teaching includes themes of protest, identity, and marginalization in modern Chinese and global history. His latest research has focused on the southern island of Hainan. He received his PhD in history from UC San Diego. We won't hold that against him here at CSU San Bernardino. His Master of Arts in Eastern Asian Languages and Cultures from Columbia, and his bachelor's degree in East Asian Studies from the State University of New York, Albany. So please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Professor Murray. Thank you very much, Marcy. Um, thank you all for being here, and thanks especially to our keynote speakers, Ona Gritz and Daniel Simpson. I'll give a brief introduction and then get out of the way. Uh, Ona Gritz is the author of the poetry collection Geode, a finalist for the 2013 Main Street Rag Poetry Book Award, and author of uh, another poetry collection, Left Standing, um, and also author of On the Whole, a story of mothering and disability. She is a Best American Essays notable author, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Plowshares, Beauty as a Verb, The New Poetry of Disability, Literary Mama, and elsewhere. She has also written two children's books, including Tangerines and Tea, My Grandparents and Me, which Nick Jr. Family Magazine named Best Alphabet Book of the Year, and Schol uh, Scholastic Parent and Child Magazine named one of its six best books for 2005. Daniel Simpson's collection of poems, School for the Blind, was published by Poetswear Prada in 2014. His work has appeared in Prairie Schooner, The Cortland Review, Passenger, The Atlanta Review, The Louisville Review, and uh, The New York Times, among other outlets. Cinco Puntos Press published his essay, Line Breaks, The Way I See Them, and four of his poems in Beauty as a Verb, The New Poetry of Disability. Uh, and by the way, uh, Beauty is a Verb, we'll have a few copies of them available in the raffle as well. He is a recipient of the Fellowship in Literature from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts and has been singing in the, uh, with the Mendelssohn Club of Philadelphia, a 140 voice choir for over 20, uh, 20 years. He works as a technical support specialist for the Library of Congress and maintains a blog entitled Inside the Invisible, a blind writer's view of living the attentive life. Dan and Ona, collaborated on a book entitled Border Songs, A Conversation in Poems. They edited More Challenges for the Delusional, Peter Murphy's Prompts and the Writing They Inspired, and also together they edited Referential Magazine, an online literary journal from 2013 to 2016. I first discovered our guest's work in the New York Times, uh, like millions of others, and invited them to, uh, to our campus. The University Diversity Committee, uh, and especially Jan Moore, put the idea into motion and brought on board Marcy Daniels and Christina Johnson and the services to stu students with disabilities. Jessica Luck and David Carlson in the English department helped facilitate the visit and there was also help from the student press organization as well as history club uh, and file for theta leaders Efren Perez, Marmar Zacher and El uh, Elvia Gonzalez. Sarah Alkajek, um, Elizabeth Perez, Pamela Crossan and others also helped to coordinate the event. And I want to especially again thank uh, Jan Moore, whose vision and leadership made this remarkable uh, visit possible. Both Gritz and Simpson beautifully combine humor and deep emotion. Gritz titles a poem, uh, one of my favorite poems uh, of Ona's, uh, my favorite title, The Muse Gets Angry Before Leaving for School. She's writing about her teenage son. And here we not only get a touching and a funny scene, but we also get a glimpse into how a poet, an artist, postpones an important errand so that she can welcome an arriving poem. We are grateful that she did. 
She begins, I'm ruining my son's life by making him wear a jacket. I'll be hot all day, he yells, tugging the collar. It's too tight anyway, slamming the door. He's outgrowing everything, jackets, pants, my directives on what to wear. Another mother would take this afternoon, shop for clothes, two sizes up. But in this silence, I hear the start of something, an image of stillness in the aftermath of my growing boy's rage. Back in the birth room, through a mirror, I saw his face, calm as milk in its cup. He opened his eyes, paused, released his voice, startling himself with its force. In his poem, A Few Things, Daniel Simpson sits us down for a casual chat with lines that alternate between breezy diversion and overwhelming power. I don't know what a rainbow looks like or that my life would be better if I could see one. I don't know why I'm writing all of this down. I know all the vegetables in V8 juice. There are at least a dozen ways to say snow in Inuit. I know vulnerability is related to hope, but I can't say how. I don't know who killed the grooms in Duncan's room. I don't know at what point you should retire a working dog. They have three roller coasters at Noble's Grove. My mother belly laughed when we got splashed on the flume. Or maybe it's four, I can't remember now. I don't know why some people give up and others don't. Great artists like Simpson and Gritz defy categorization or marginalization, even while they champion the marginalized. They challenge norms we didn't know we had internalized, norms we didn't realize were obstructions to a full and honest encounter with the world, and their voices range from the quiet to the ferocious. Finally, they lift the reader with catharsis and wisdom, but be warned, they may knock us off balance. But today we are pushed off balance by wit and beauty and finally by grace. We are off balance, but we are in masterful hands. With Grits and Simpson, if we care to listen and if we dare to hear, we are guided to a new vantage and it is one that transcends what we thought we knew. It is my distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome Ona Grits and Daniel Simpson. Wow, well, thank you, Jeremy. I hope we can take you on the road with us. <laughs> that was a really wonderful introduction. Well, good afternoon. It's an honor and a real pleasure to have been invited to come and spend this day with you. Ona and I want to thank Jeremy Murray and the Office of Services for Students with Disabilities, Jan Moore, and everyone else who had a hand in bringing us here. In the email exchanges leading up to our visit, we asked if those inviting us had thoughts about what they'd like us to talk about. One suggestion is that we talk about our road to becoming professional writers, including its relationship to disability and any obstacles we may have encountered. It's funny though, the word that caught our attention first was professional. Professional, we asked each other in stereo. Technically, I suppose we are. We write books and we get paid when they sell. We sometimes get paid for articles we've written. If we stretch the net to include writing related teaching and occasional readings and speaking engagements, that ups our legitimacy, I guess, as professionals. But I know I didn't set out to be a professional writer. 15 years before dedicating myself to writing, I had learned a thing or two about setting out to be professional and, well, let me confess, uh, famous. <laughs> then it had been as an organist. Yes, I technically became a professional working in a thriving mainline church, but it didn't exactly lead to my dreams of acclaimed recitalists coming true. I hope that you will find something about dedication, passion, and persistence to take away from our talk. But I also want to strike a tone of admonition. I'm not saying don't aspire to be writers, artists, or whatever your dreams are calling you to do. 
if that's what you really want to do. I'm just saying, be a little zen about it. Do it for the thing itself, not the external trappings. So, how did I get here? That's a question we often ask ourselves. <laughs> I had the good fortune to be born to parents who read to me. We read all of the Bobsy twin books, which were especially important to me and my identical twin brother, Dave. We read the usual fairy tales, classic children's poems, and later, Jack London and retellings of Bible stories. Story time with mom or dad made, a lot more, made me a lot more interested in going to bed. Regular home life ended for me, however, when I was four. Back then, in the 1950s, nearly all children like me and my brother were sent to residential schools for the blind. The lucky ones among us who lived close enough to the school could go home for the weekends. Fortunately, all my teachers in the early grades did read to me and my classmates. Miss Stout, who read to us at the end of every day in first grade, stands out for me. I can remember how immediately that amazing opening sentence of Charlotte's Web, where's Papa going with that X, reeled me into a world far from Philadelphia and the high brick wall surrounding the Overbrook School for the Blind. In a way, it felt like instantaneous travel every afternoon to some farm just down the road from where my grandparents lived. Even on beautiful days when I would have otherwise longed to go outside and play, or even miserable ones when I wouldn't have minded sitting in the dorm playing records. I hated the bell that ended classes, and the way just when Templeton was about to do something bad, or right in the middle of something beautiful Wilbur was saying to Charlotte to make her feel better, Miss Stout would clap the book closed and tell us to gather our things and run along. I hated that bell for ruining the magic. Miss Stout did something else, which had an equally significant effect on my life as a reader and eventually as a writer. One Friday morning in spring, after we had acquired more reading skills, Miss Stout announced that she had a very special surprise for each of us. She walked around to each person and handed him or her a thin packet of braille paper held together with winged fasteners. I found two lines of braille in the middle of an otherwise blank front page. My book of poems, I read, with Daniel Simpson directly below the title. Oh, mine, I thought. My own book of poems. Let's open our booklets, Miss Stout said, and see if we can read the first poem. Carl Sandburg wrote it about fog. I especially liked the part about fog being like a cat. I like that you could think of something as something else. At first, I would have told you my parents didn't do much thinking like that. But then I thought about all the times they would pick something I had already felt and use that to describe something I couldn't see. In fact, they did it quite often and very well. The next poem was about sitting on a stone and singing to birds. I liked something about the way it sounded, the way alone and stone went together, and birds and words, little sound surprises. And then there was a poem I thought my cousins on the farm would have liked best, something about going to a pasture. When Miss Stout read it, I loved the way she said, you come too. It made me feel like for just a moment, I could leave Overbrook any time I wanted. One of the best things about the School for the Blind was its library. These days, I can't just walk into a library, browse the stacks, pull out any volume that calls to me, sit down at a nearby table, and try it out. Overbrook's library remains one of the best microcosmic models of what a truly accessible world would look like for me. 
Besides its extensive braille collection, the library possessed a large collection of talking books, which we could listen to in soundproof booths. My brother, our friend Bob, and I made a pact. Whoever got there first after school should close booths for the other two of us so that anyone else would think they were already in use and give up. That's how fierce we were about reading. I got in a lot of reading time in my last two years at Overbrook. Our seventh and eighth grade teacher, Mr. Caton, negotiated a special arrangement with our house mother so we could use his classroom as a reading sanctuary after school when we would otherwise just been killing time outside, rain or shine. Also, figuring that boys going through puberty shouldn't be subjected anymore to house mothers walking in on them as they dressed and undressed in an open dorm. Overbrook provided cubicles with doors. They allowed just enough privacy that you could sit on your bed with the lights out, a real advantage to reading Braille, and read all night if you wanted to without anyone but your roommate knowing. I don't know how I would have survived Overbrook were it not for reading. It, along with listening to the radio and having an active imagination, provided me a way to escape the high brick wall and go out into the world. Let me pause for a minute on Mr. Caton in order to tell you something about him that goes beyond any influence he had on me as a reader and future writer. When I was in fourth grade, a third grade student drowned in the school's indoor pool. Mr. Caton was the gym teacher on duty. He quickly and quietly vanished for a couple of years, then returned to Overbrook to teach English. Like everyone else, I never spoke to him about Chester's death, but on some level, I marveled at his willingness to return to the scene of such trauma in order to do so much good for us students. He gave his lunch time to teach boys how to play the oboe. He even talked the school into letting him take a couple of us boys home with him for dinner and an overnight. A big deal for us who had lost most of our home lives. I didn't have the words for it then, but all of this gave me the idea that people can keep their hearts open and make it through trauma past obstacles. Without a word of preaching, he taught me an important lesson about character. In ninth grade, when my brother uh, and I became two of the first blind people in our county to try public school, all of our teachers just seemed to know what to do. They provided flexibility and accommodation without being protective or less demanding. We were encouraged to try sculpting and abstract drawing in art class and running the high hurdles in gym. Uh, that one didn't work out quite so well, but we tried and other sports did work a lot better, including football. Like too many students, I did have an English teacher who could have killed my confidence as a writer with her snide red ink on my class essays. But then Mrs. Onderdonk came along in my senior year. A, fool, a few of the really cool kids snickered behind her back because she didn't mind being a little different. But I'll never forget how a bunch of dusty old ballads came to life the day she walked in dressed in medieval garb, turned out all the lights, and accompanied herself on her guitar as if it were a lute. I learned from her how to read a poem, and I learned from the recording she played of T.S. Eliot reading the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock that I didn't have to understand a poem to be drawn into it. Soon after that experience, I was sitting in Latin class, one hand on what I should have been reading, and the other hand on the hollow men, so I could memorize it just because I loved how it sounded. 
I have a problem, but it's a great one to have. I love too many things in this world. I blossomed as an English major in college, but I also picked up a second major in music and continued studying organ, which I had begun during high school. By my senior year, I had invested so much into both majors and gotten so much back from them that I couldn't decide which path to take for graduate school. With about as much logic as a coin flip, I chose music. Ah, the proverbial road not taken. Still, had I not followed this music path, I would never have sung so many awe-inspiring works with choir and orchestra, and never have studied organ in Paris. It didn't all work out the way I dreamed, however. Maybe even fewer people can make a full-time living out of playing the organ than writing poems. I sure know how to pick them. <laughs> On top of that, I had to recognize my limitations. While my blind organ teacher from Paris could memorize the complete works of Bach and the whole of French organ music from the Renaissance to the present, I simply couldn't. I can say with pride that I brought wonderful musicianship to whatever I played, but I was not a prolific memorizer. For financial reasons, I left church work and became a computer programmer. At first I liked it, but while programming did require creativity, it didn't satisfy something inside me the way the arts had. I also got very tired of the corporate life. So I started taking creative writing courses, and soon I was finagling to get myself laid off so I could go to grad school with a severance package. I went to Penn studying poetry with an undersung poetry, poet named Gregory Janikian, whom I highly recommend that you seek out. But the question of what to do afterward hung over me. As I immersed myself in reading and writing, I got excited and curious about how one could communicate this love of literature to inner city high school students. So I studied to become a teacher. Soon after graduating, I had my own classroom at the Philadelphia High School for girls. I have never had more contact with people of color and teenagers than during my four years of teaching high school. I love the challenges and rewards of trying to connect students with literature and through writing with themselves. Math problem. If you have 160 students and you spend 15 minutes on each one in a week, be it through reading their work, writing back to them or tutoring them, you've already worked a 40 hour week and you haven't even planned one lesson or taught one. Needless to say, I got none of my own writing done during the school year. In Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, I first encountered the maxim, leap and a net will open. That's just nuts, I thought. I fought with her every inch of the way, and yet leaping is exactly what I ended up doing. I figured I had saved enough that if I lived very simply and perhaps found some small source of income, I could make it financially for a year. I took that year's leave of absence to write 17 years ago, and I never went back. I couldn't give up the reading writing time again. These days I do part-time work as a technical support specialist for the Library of Congress. I have the mornings for reading and writing, then I work afternoons from home for the library. It's funny how if you live long enough, different parts of your life can blend skills in ways you would never have predicted. Who knew when I left church music for computer programming that I'd be gaining the skills that would fund me when I left teach English, teaching English to become a writer? 
After a living alone for 25 years, I went to a poetry conference, met an amazing woman who turned her rich, creative life upside down for me. And now here we are, married, living together, working on separate floors by day, and sharing a life full of music, theater, books, and most of all, a fabulous ongoing conversation. In addition, we get to live our lives a second time through writing. Joan Didion said, quote, I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see, and what it means, what I want and what I fear, end quote. That gift of a second life through writing belongs to all of us, whether we're professional or not. I encourage all of you to take it, even if that's just setting aside 15 minutes a couple of times a week to see what comes out. The poet Mary Oliver once told me at a conference that writing is like making friends with a shy person. If you keep your appointments, even the 15 minute ones, that shy person will start trusting you, start talking, start doing some thinking behind the scenes. Make friends with that shy person. Keep showing up and see what happens. It could change your life. I find it interesting that I've spoken more about reading and writing than about disability and overcoming obstacles. That may be because reading and writing have been integral ways of dealing with obstacles and pro processing the unknown, and in so doing, of helping to point the way forward. It's also because disability is only part of the story, as you will hear in the poems Ona and I read back and forth later. I am much more than blind. I struggle with religious questions that have nothing to do with my being born blind. I'm puzzled and intrigued by the unspoken words and the smallest gestures that mark the spaces between people, just as you might be. The poet Pat Parker once said something that has stayed with me. She said, the first thing you must do is forget that I'm black. Second, you must never forget that I'm black. Yes, I think that's the ideal relationship for me too. I want you to forget that I'm blind and I don't want you to ever forget that I'm blind. That said, I don't want you to walk on eggshells around me. If I can tell that you're trying to build a connection with me, not just pet my dog or pump me with questions about blindness before you've even said hello, I'm pretty forgiving. In fact, I want that same, same kind of forgiveness from people different from me. So go ahead, make some mistakes around me. Just be willing to be corrected and try not to keep making the same mistake. I used to lead workshops on disability awareness for librarians. And I'd say to them, think about responding to a patron with a disability as you would any patron with a reference question. The first thing you ask is, can I help you? If the person says no, you have to trust them. You let them go about their business unless they ask for help. If they say yes, then all you need to do is ask the second question. How can I best help you? You don't have to memorize a list of do's and don'ts. You don't have to know everything. The content of everyone's life affects their writing. Mine happens to be not only the blindness itself, but also the effects of society's attitudes toward people with disabilities. If I hadn't been blind, my parents would never have sent me or been strongly urged to send me to a residential school when I was just four years of age. But they never would have moved to Philadelphia either 
which opened an array of opportunities, especially cultural ones. Schools for the blind tended toward exceptional music education. So who knows if I would ever have become an organist and lived in Paris if I hadn't been exposed to chapel and organ music almost every day for six years. I am white, male, Protestant, and heterosexual. If you think of oppression in terms of who's up and who's down, I am definitely in the up position on all four counts. But blindness and disability put me in the down position. As one of very few students with a disability in a public school, I definitely got to experience being an outsider. Of course, the trick is noticing that you're on the outside without letting victimhood take you over. Of course, no one enjoys being oppressed, but you can learn to enjoy being you, different as you are. People often ask me if I would under, ever undergo an operation to give me sight, even if in doing so, I'd risk the light perception I do have and the possible medical and emotional complications. At one time I would have said, yes, that we only go around once and I would want to experience everything I could, including seeing people's faces and bodies, seeing sunrises and sunsets, and all the stuff of beauty poets write about. Now, however, I think I'd say no. I love my life. I'm really happy. I've spent 66 years developing this very identity. Do I really want to mess around with that now? The Israelites had a name for God, Yahweh, which translates loosely as, I am who I am. There's a real integrity in that. I am who I am. Even in my writing, I've stopped trying to describe visual things I don't fully understand, relying instead on the senses I know. No, I don't think you'll see me heading for the operating room anytime soon. I still have too many plans, hopes, and dreams for the life I'm currently living with the identity I currently have. I am who I am. I figure if it's good enough for Yahweh, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Thank you. The summer after my freshman year of college, when I was 18 years old, I had the privilege of going to Boulder, Colorado to take poetry workshops at a school called Naropa Institute. That was my first experience of being around not just published authors, but very famous ones. This of course was terribly exciting, but what I was really interested in that summer was finding a boyfriend. I had someone in mind, in fact, my cute classmate, Rich. He was very friendly, but I couldn't tell at first whether my feelings for him were mutual. Then, one night at a party, he kissed me, and it was a great kiss, slow and thoughtful, like a good conversation. The next morning, he showed up at my door and invited my roommates and me to go pick apricots at a tree he'd discovered behind the public library. Four of us grabbed paper grocery bags and trooped over, and when we got there, Rich climbed to the top of the tree and started tossing down fruit, which I caught in my skirt. I thought this was the most romantic thing ever, so while it was happening, I knew I'd go home and write a poem about it. To my mind, it had everything a good poem needed. It had a cute guy, a hope, a kiss, and even some nature thrown in. I looked for that poem recently, but apparently I didn't keep it. 
I'm sure it was a typical love poem written by a typical teenager, since that's what I was for the most part, an aspiring poet, but otherwise a pretty ordinary girl. Or maybe the real truth is that I was aspiring to be both a poet and ordinary, or at least to be seen as ordinary by cute guys and by the millions of people I imagined one day reading my poems. I'm tempted to say here that I had a secret, but that's not really accurate. I had something that people who knew me knew about, and people who didn't could see, but it wasn't something I made a habit of talking about. I have a mild form of cerebral palsy, and like many people who have relatively minor disabilities, I put a lot of energy into pretending it wasn't there. Cerebral palsy is caused by damage to the part of the brain that controls motor function. And this usually happens at or around birth. The way I understand it is this. My brain sends messages to the left side of my body, and the muscles read them loud and clear. But when it sends them to the right side, the muscles, muscles somehow get garbled or mistranslated, and the muscles only partially understand. Cerebral palsy affects each person differently. Mine compromises my balance and coordination and the fine motor skills on my right side. All of this is to say that before I was that young woman collecting apricots in my skirt and flirting with my crush, I was the kid on the block who couldn't climb fences or roller skate or jump rope or even shuffle a deck of cards. For a brief time, I was made to wear a leg brace, but even without it, my walk was stiff and awkward and slow, and when I tried to run, all I could manage was a combination gallop and skip. I was fortunate to grow up on a block that was rich with girls my own age, and at a time when we were pretty much left to our own devices whenever we weren't in school. And this was true even when we were just five and six years old. On long summer afternoons, we would push our doll carriages over to each other's houses or bring our color forms and light bright sets over to each other's stoops. When someone suggested a more physical activity like tag, which of course requires running, or hopscotch, which requires first standing on one foot and jumping and then jumping on the other foot, my go-to response was to say, boring, and to suggest my own favorite games, like doctor, or house, or later, rock star wives. <laughs> if this sounds like a poor little cripple girl story, I don't mean it to. Sure, I might have felt a twinge when my friends would choose to um, play double dutch or to race one another down the block, literally leaving me in the dust. But I was telling the truth when I said those activities didn't interest me. They were a reminder that I was slower and clumsier than the other kids, but that otherwise I didn't think about that all that much. My attention was on the stories I was continually acting out in my mind, whether or not my friends joined me, where I was a medical professional, or a wife and mother, or maybe a a teenage supermodel. <laughs> Arguably, it was a coping mechanism, this daydreaming my way out of my disabled body with its awkward moves and underdeveloped muscles. But meanwhile, I was developing another kind of muscle, that of my imagination. In seventh grade, I acquired a floral-covered notebook with lavender pages. There's a term you may have heard, purple prose. Wikipedia defines it as text that is too extravagant, ornate, or flowery so that it breaks the flow and draws excessive attention to itself. I don't know the origins of the phrase, but I wouldn't be surprised if it came from the unfortunate pairing of floral-covered notebooks with lavender pages and 12-year-old girls. True to form, I filled mine with florid, overly sentimental poems. This, 
together with reading, was actually the perfect activity for me. It allowed me to continue to flex and strengthen that muscle of my imagination as I slowly outgrew my passion for make-believe. Meanwhile, my relationship to my disability was starting to change. As high school neared, my friends began to spend less time jumping rope and playing tag and climbing fences, and more time listening to records and flipping through magazines and sizing up boys. A part of me began to relax. I could do those things as well as anybody. But at the same time, we were all also growing more concerned with appearances. So as we fussed over our hair and clothes and experimented with makeup, my cerebral palsy became less about whether or not I could keep up and more about how people saw me. Did my limp make me less pretty? Probably, but then I didn't have to look at it, so I mostly continued to just press, press it to the back of my mind. It helped that I was still really into reading and writing because when I was involved with either of those things, I was hardly in my body at all. Now, just as I was lucky to grow up on a block that provided an instant community of friends, I was also lucky to have wonderful English teachers who taught me that writing, I'm sorry, that reading wasn't only a means of escape. It was also a way to stretch my thinking. When I went away to college, at SUNY Purchase, a small liberal arts school in New York. My professors pushed this further, and it was there, rather than with the famous poets at Naropa, that I met my first real writing mentor. Harry Stessel was a shy, unassuming, and undiscovered poet who also happened to be a fabulous teacher. Early in our working together, Harry told me, good poems aren't written, they're carved. What he meant by this was that the true work of shaping a poem and of discovering what's in it rarely happens when you're writing a first draft. Rather, it happens later, when you're editing. He taught me this by using my own rough drafts, which, while no longer on lavender paper, still had plenty of purple prose to shave away. In, our, in the, my first months of my independent study with Harry, I'd leave his office with pages covered in X's. You don't need this line, he'd tell me, or this whole stanza for that matter, X, 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 until finally he'd circle the few lines he thought were worth keeping. I imagine a lot of students would come away from such a meeting feeling discouraged, but I found the process thrilling. As I watched Harry find the small, artful thing in the rough slabs I showed him, I learned to see what he saw. My poetry notebook may have been mostly X'd out, but inside those small ovals Harry drew were lines that were original and musical and somehow true. More of this, he was telling me. Look what you did here. Do it again. As a young woman with a limp, I'd given up on the idea that I'd ever be a great beauty, but I was learning to make something beautiful. And of course, while I wrote, I could train my attention wherever I wanted, and I could portray the speaker, the I of the poem, however I chose. A few years after, I placed her at the base of an apricot tree, staring up through the branches at a young man named Rich. I met another Richard, who was handsome and athletic, and much to my surprise, crazy about me. Richard loved biking and soccer and skiing, and he was really good at these things, which of course meant we had very little in common. But though I never said so aloud, I thought it meant something else too. In my experience, handsome athletic guys didn't tend to go for disabled girls, and yet Richard had chosen me. So, using that if A equals B kind of logic that I was never very good at, I deduced that our relationship meant that I was pretty much done with my disability. You thought I was done with make-believe too, right? <laughs> so did I. Richard and I married, and I stayed in that world of pretend long enough that we had a child together. Throughout my pregnancy, I felt sure that I was ready 
and that I'd be a great mom. After all, I'd had all that practice years ago with my baby dolls and games of house. But then my son was born, and I very quickly realized just how different actual infants are from the dolls I used to play with. They're bigger and squirmier, and they're slippery when they're wet. And even though they scream and cry and keep you up at night, they matter, not just more than those dolls ever did. They matter more than anything. They're these fragile, helpless, complete human beings who trust you. They trust that you won't drop them, or squeeze them too tightly, or fall down the stairs while you're carrying them. Taking care of a baby was the hardest physical activity I've, I'd ever taken on. And while I figured out what I couldn't, could do and couldn't do and where I needed to ask for help, I finally realized my disability was real. It was a hard lesson, but it also came as a relief. As a make-believe able-bodied person, being clumsy and having an odd-looking walk were things to be embarrassed about, which is why I tried not to think about them all that much. But as a person with a disability, I had specific limitations, but overall I did quite well. My son taught me that. He's been one of my great teachers. So what does any of this have to do with writing? Not much at first, except that it was deepening me as a person. I was beginning to understand who I was in the world, which could only deepen who I was on the page. I found another of my great teachers when my son was eight years old. His father and I had been divorced for several years by then, and I met and fell in love with a fellow poet who also had a disability. As you'll soon hear, Dan writes openly and beautifully about his experiences as a blind man. When I first encountered him and his poems, this struck me as really radical. Rather than write to escape his limitations, he explored them in his work. Slowly, it occurred to me that I could do that too. One day, shortly after Dan and I met, I woke up thinking about that long ago July morning with the first Rich and the apricots. I remembered how when Rich showed up at my door, my first thought was that there was no way I could climb a tree, but there was also no way that I wanted to say that out loud. Thinking fast, I decided to stay in my impractical wraparound skirt so I could use it as an excuse while the others climbed the tree in their shorts and sneakers. When we got there and everybody was in the tree except for me, Rich called down, catch, and I had to make another split-second decision. I either had to admit that I couldn't catch anything more challenging than a balloon in my clumsy hands, or let him and my other new friends see that because of my cerebral palsy, one of my legs was thinner than the other. That's when I was lifting the skirt to catch the apricots. Finally, after almost 25 years, I sat down and wrote a second draft of that poem. This time, I put in all those details. And what I discovered was that it was actually freeing to allow my disability into the poem. And I also saw that the reason I didn't wind up with a poem worth keeping the first time around was that by leaving out the limitations of my body and how I felt about it at the time, kept the poem floating on the surface. It may have been shapely and even lyrical because those were skills I developed early, but that's not enough. A writer needs to have something to say. So while writing had once been a way to escape my disability, it became the thing it's, that actually brought me back to my body. For the first time, I wrote about what it was like to have a child, to be a child with cerebral palsy to be an adolescent with a disability and a struggling new mother. Some of the stories grew too layered and complex for those finely carved poems I knew how to write, so I branched out 
and began writing essays and memoir. Now, what drives me as a writer is the desire to take the stuff of life and shape it into something not just beautiful, but meaningful, to find both the lyricism and the deeper truth, and to learn from the writing and the crafting what I might not otherwise come to understand. I don't only write about disability, far from it, but finally inviting it into my work broke me open. It helped me realize that if you write from lived experience as I do, what's most interesting for the reader, what makes the story human and relatable, aren't the ways that you fit in, nor is it your triumphs and successes. Your imperfections are actually where your stories live, where you struggle and falter, where you make mistakes and then change and grow because of them where you're most uniquely and specifically you. Thank you. Well, the, the next section is uh, reading poems back and forth. This is a swath of poems that eventually morphed into with some additions and alterations into our book, Border Song, Border Songs. Um, I'm aware we're a little tight on time, but I th should we just go ahead and do this? Yeah. Okay. All day, well, these poems were, were not written to talk to each other. They just happened to be the things that we were talking about separately and put together. All day, new friends, Massachusetts Youth Hostel, summer of 99. We three rode in the back seat of Larry's 88 Impala, you on my left, Karen on my right, naked except for our bathing suits and sandals, Larry driving, it being his car, and singing with Paul to an REM tape on tiny speakers, while we three talked about who smoked grass and when and what it was like and marijuana brownies and the difference between them and smoking. All the while, our warm knees and thighs, hips and arms rearranging themselves against each other as we jangled over ruts and potholes, jangling memories and wishes loose so that I, knowing we were one day old together and tomorrow this would end, said, my breathing feeling thick, where were you all, you and Karen and Paul and Larry, when I was in high school, the first blind kid trying to hear a few friends in the pep club Thanksgiving Eve bonfire crowd, trying to find his way to a party of the coolest classmates. Where were you? Which prompted Karen to say, yeah, it would have been great. And you, you on my left to say, hey, what about playing basketball? Can we do that? I mean, there must be a way we can figure that out. 18. We never spoke of what my body couldn't do. So when Jen and Kay left to pick apricots from the spindly tree behind the library, I hesitated. But Rich would be there. I showed up in a wraparound skirt, my excuse to stand at the base, pluck from the bottom branch. The fruit was concentrated at the top. While the others climbed, of course it was rich I watched, squinting up at him as I had all summer. The night before, he'd finally kissed me, his tongue tentatively grazing my own. Catch he called now, and I lifted my skirt to form a net, no thought to palsy, to exposing my uneven legs. When the first tangy oval dropped into the voil, I had already begun to taste it, how it felt to be chosen and whole. Acts of Faith. Friends describe colors to me. Trumpets are red, they say. Clarinets, purple. And oranges, 
taste like orange. I believe them, no reason not to. I buy books to read with equipment for the blind. It is an act of faith. In the bookstore, all the pages are blank. At the checkout counter, I pay with a bill that earlier the grocer said was a 20, or I sign a blank slip wherever the cashier tells me. No big deal, I say to myself, walking out the door. Nobody knows everything. I smell the city, oil and brown. The yellow sun shines lemonade, which means the sky must be blue. Left, I'm sorry, hemiplegia. Left, my bright half gets all of it. Soft, sharp, prickly, wet, lined. But press your head against my right shoulder. I sense weight, but no warmth. Your cheek to my right touch, stubble free, whether or not you shave. Under my right fingers, your silver hair holds no silk, nor can I feel it part into single strands. I'll tell you how I know you in the dark. Left whispers the details. Right listens and believes. Vigilance and Dissembling Since I don't see and have no visual cues, I'm fascinated by how sighted people dissemble. I bet they keep their faces unflustered, while behind their stationary eyes, another set of eyes checks you out. I say this because in conversation, I try to act undivided, while in fact, I'm on alert for any glitch in composure, any revelation of an actor playing a part. It's often a matter of tone of voice. Most people don't realize it goes even further that I'm listening to them breathe. I hear body language. Someone talking with her right hand while I hold her left doesn't know how much I know from the way her body moves, as if she never touched a tie line to a dock and guessed the boat was bobbing up and down. When the man you love is a blind man. You can stop shaving your legs when the temperature drops, and he'll say he likes the change in texture with the seasons. You can leave that bit of silver in your bangs. Your fashion advice will be gospel. When he tells you you're beautiful, you'll know he's talking about something in you that's timeless, something about you that's true. If teasing, he says, smearing color on your cheeks is what a clown does. Explain how a touch of blush can change the feel of entering a room, and he'll listen. He'll always listen, like the wide world is a raft with only two people on it, and he finds you the more interesting of the two. Imagine going with him to the Rockies, he hears you sigh and asks what the mountains look like. All you have are words, awesome, grandeur. But when you describe that feeling of seeing your one life for the flicker it is, he knows. Oh, he says, oh, it's like hearing music in a cathedral. listening to New York radio in the middle of the night. There in Insomniac City, where the dial can easily hold five languages beyond English and stations bleed into each other, Emily Dickinson, satisfied she could no longer see to see, spoke through a piano while a Spanish man, half crying, half singing, declared he too would die if the one he most desired did not give him her undying love. Between Emily and the Spanish man, the sitar spoke harmoniously about rock-steady faith while picking its way along a path of dissonant doubt. 
commercial life finally put to bed, Lenin woke up from a good dream, his imagination intact. He sang with the sitar, calling the chutney and raita left over from last night's dinner to put on spiritual livery. They, in turn, inspired the beans in my cabinet to take on a holy presence. And the cabinets themselves, dazed at first, recalled the distant spirits of trees. And when the whole house became tuned like this to the radio, my father kindly caught a coach from that other kingdom to sit in my living room, if only for a moment, and casually talk with me of ordinary life. Donner Lake. I chose the still mirror of this lake, clean sky preening above it, redwoods doubling green. The hungry name, ancient history, and sudden winter. This was August. From the radio, John Lennon asked us, imagine no heaven. We let your heavy ashes go. First smoke, then silt. If you had some other place in mind, you never said, or I wasn't listening just then. Some holy Saturday, you will rise from your bed at 4.30 in the morning to find bitter weeping outside your window and your yard filled with trees that were not there the night before, large leaves everywhere soaking your hair with dew, the thick smell of olives heavy in the air. It is Peter still crying up through the crust of the earth, and though no cocks have crowed yet, and there is no farm for hours, you are poised for the marking of betrayal. What will you do if following Leopard Road or Route 13, you should be drawn by a congregation of curious crows to a scariot hanging from a tree? The neck groove lapping over the rope, his toga tented at the crotch. And what if from the moon come strains of Hollywood's fourth cousin to Gregorian chant with celluloid clicks and pops to let you know this is old and serious? And what if the man who made the cross sleepwalks beside the road in the underbrush? And your father now remembers that yesterday, between 12 and 3, the sky grew dark over your neighborhood. Will you kneel down in the road and pray? Run to your home to take from your kitchen cinnamon and nutmeg, the only spices appropriate for the Savior's tomb? Call the police? Or walk to your church in silence, hoping that the sun upon your back is really the large hand of the fisherman reconciled? Exodus. And uh, there's one line of Hebrew which is Adonai Echad, which means God is one, or there is only one God. A woman has painted her doorpost with blood, so that now, in gray half-light, she shakes a small shoulder, pats a curved back, and her children startle awake, allow themselves to be rushed into clothes. Trusting the hush, they quietly follow, as she walks with their father, as they join a river of families coursing from home. They walk and walk, a block of bread dough on her back. She is used to waking early, used to hefting, carrying, hurrying tasks, such as the life they steal away from. And she could almost feel light, listening to the sound of her children's feet beside her, breathing the baby's sour milk head resting on her chest. But she hears the cries of those other mothers, the ones waking now to the stiff, unblinking bodies of their boys. Joined by a thousand voices, the wail rises, thicker than the dust they kick up as they walk. Can we let ourselves be loved by such a God? 
She'd ask this of her husband, but she knows what he would say. Adonai Echad, what choice do we have? Providence. I met my girlfriend in yoga. I was there on a whim. Her class across town had been canceled. Meant to be, she laughed six months later. Dumb luck, I said. When the tsunami struck, Thomas Goodpenny crossed himself and thanked God for his charmed life. The deal he was supposed to close in Sri Lanka had already fallen through. Finally, when pushed to the wall, my mother admitted, no, I don't absolutely know there's a heaven. Nobody does. But I don't want to take the chance by not believing. I just shuffle the options. Take my dog in the car and hope there's no accident, or leave her at home and pray for no fire. Yet last week at a writer's workshop, the leader dumped a pile of cookie fortunes in front of my girlfriend. Take one, he said, and see if it doesn't somehow surprise your poem. Wait till you hear this, Mr. Dumb Luck, she whispered to me, tucking it into her pocket. Back in her room, she unfolded it. Stop searching forever. Happiness is right next to you. I thought she meant it for me. She thought it was meant for her. First anniversary. Once, as a child, I had my father close his eyes for a surprise, then distractedly walked him into a wall. Now, guiding you, I know to mention each curb, each puddle to be stepped over, to place your palm on the chipped rail beside the subway stair before I follow you down. All the while, the tip of your folded white cane peeks from the side pocket of your pack like something inner and exposed. We've spent this year learning one another. One night you asked the color of my hair, then repeated the word brown, an abstract fact to be memorized. The dark strands were splayed on your chest as I listened to the beat beneath skin and rib and thought about trust, your life in your hand given over to mine. Why I'm so mixed up about rhyme? Because I'm just as mixed up about home. Whether I want dinner every night with the same people who might be kind to me or just as easily start a fight. And it's not just rhyme, but rhythm. The way the two, combined, control and shape a line. Soon, lines make stanzas as walls make rooms and houses that keep horses from coming in to dine. But isn't it good sometimes to force things to go where they wouldn't otherwise? In the apparent safety of a partner in a home, isn't there always a surprise? Oh, I am a wild pony galloping across Chincoteague, governed only by my desires, unencumbered by familial ties, and simultaneously a man with the same woman every night, my domesticated hand resting between her thighs. Six Roller Coasters. Ethan pulls Dan, almost at a run, toward those massive structures that rise and dip like the outlines of distant hills. Their plan, to conquer all of them, despite pounding rain. I read Hemingway in the shelter of the food court, where they appear occasionally, flushed and dripping in their ponchos, to describe the fastest, the longest drop, the one that whips like the tail of the guide dog we left at home. Thumb keeping place in my book, I think about what men build through shared bravery and fear, and marvel at my 12-year-old, willing to hold Dan's hand in public for this greater good. 
There are moments on the storm runner, the Fahrenheit, when I know he closes his eyes to see how it feels to Dan. This man, who might have been his father, had I a better time of it early in my own wild ride. Questions? It was you, darling. Oh, it was most definitely you. Even in a dream, I know the exact angle of our noses in kissing. I know the fragrant melange of fish and flower that is your olfactory fingerprint in the nakedness of love. So it was strange then that you were my sister in this dream, this dream where we giggled and worried that our father might innocently, uh, imprudently peek in. Not my sister, to be precise, but in the role of sister. I've been asking myself all day, why? Why, with all the wanting, no reduction in our usual desire, would you be made a sister? To send me back to my real sister with better than I've given her before? To show me what long time lived in love looks like? And what if we all had sisters who would fall asleep with us? Would we learn earlier to love? Come, my love, isn't it time we were family? Last poem. There among the halves. A girl with one prosthetic leg dances at a club in short skirts and short skirt and heels on the cover of Sunday styles. Her silver thigh textured like sequins. Hair over her face, not to hide, but she's lost in that song. I tape her photo next to my desk. Remember the morning I had you touch my calves, the right thin with palsy, the other full and strong. That same day we kissed like teens in a New York cafe. Your guide dog curled like a throw rug at our feet. Anyone else making out, you asked? Just us, I said, eyeing an indifferent crowd. And there, among the halves, those with sight, with matching limbs, you whispered that my breasts spell a perfect sea in braille. So this is how it feels, I thought, to inherit the earth. How it feels loving one of my own. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't think we left you much time for questions, um, although we'd be happy to stick around for a few minutes. Um, but maybe we have time for a couple before we hit the deadline. Um, and by the way, don't take personally what I said about asking questions. This is a different situation. Uh, we actually like nosy. So, and if you can top questions that the girls asked me when they, I was teaching, well, I'll be very surprised. <laughs> So go for it. What was the nosiest question you were asked by a high school girl? Well, Mr. Simpson, um, so you're a guy and um, guys stand up when they pee how, how do you do that? How do you, how do you make sure you hit the toilet? So that was the question. Can anyone top that? Yeah. Really, anything's, anything's fair game. And I know we're, we're, we're gonna be breaking up here soon, but. Yeah. Not very much. Uh, were you able to hear the question? Um, I most, uh, a microphone is coming, so um, we'll repeat the question and then I'll answer. Oh, 
When you were younger, were you able to discuss your disability with your friends? I, I mostly didn't. I, um, I think I maybe gave a vibe that it wasn't okay to ask. And um, if I had it to do, do over, I would do it differently. But the few times that it would come up, mostly what they would say is, oh, it's barely noticeable, which would, it was kind of a way of um, dismissing it and, and maybe playing along with my own way of let's just pretend it's not there. Um, I will tell you that I actually didn't know it was visible until I was playing with one of the less uh, tactful girls on the block. And one day she said, let's walk around like people who limp. And she got up off the fence where we were sitting and started limping, and I just tried to imitate her. And then she said, oh, well, just walk like you usually do. <laughs> nice. <laughs> In the back there. Hi. This question is for, I didn't catch the names because I came in late. Yes. But um, uh, my question was uh, about the editing process for your poetry. How do you engage that process? I'm sorry, was it for both of us? Um, I'm sorry, it was for Mr. Uh, Dan, yeah. <laughs> it's for, Dan, sorry. Yeah, the, uh, the editing process. Um, well, what I find is that I use the, the device I was reading from at the lectern, it's called a Braille note, and it's basically sort of like a Braille laptop with a, I mean, a laptop that has synthesized speech and a, a Braille display. And I like to write my first drafts on that because I can keep, looking at what I just read, read what I just wrote, and um, somehow it happened, it helps to have it right beneath my fingers. I could type it on a computer and listen to it with speech or the braille display on that, but it's a little clunkier. And so I, what I tend to do is first drafts on the braille note, and then I type or transfer the, the file to a computer and uh, edit it more using speech. Uh, it sometimes helps me actually hear what it what it's going to sound like, but it's also f um, a little faster in some ways. Thank you. Is that is that where you exactly where you're going? Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Sure. When you taught at the uh, high school, girls' high school in Philadelphia, were you like a trendsetter, or had they hired other teachers with disabilities prior to that? Oh, uh, I was. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I wasn't a trendsetter because nobody that I know of did it after. I was a. I was a one-off. <laughs> Um, but uh, I got a lot of help. I actually had met the superintendent of schools who I, th I found to be a really forward-thinking guy and um, told him of my interest in teaching in a public school. And he really um, welcomed me and actually put me in touch with his administrative assistant who happened to, she could see um, quite a lot, but she was technically uh, legally blind. And so she had a real understanding of what kind of support I would need. And so um, the school district um, hired a classroom assistant to help me with writing on the board and keeping track of classroom management, that kind of stuff. And uh, they also gave me my own set of print books for whatever, uh, I was teaching English forever, whatever novels or memoirs or poetry I wanted my class to do because I couldn't always guarantee that I could get my Braille copies from a library at the same time that nobody else was using the print sets of books. So they were really terrifically supportive. Yep, there you go. I, 
I'm curious if you were ever very angry or very depressed about by your fate at any given point, and if you, if your poetry reflected that at any point in your lives, because the poets, the poems that you read, and and the stories that you recounted, seemed like you've done a lot of work thinking about your lives and and coming to terms with your, uh, with your disabilities. But I'm curious if in that process there was deep depression and anger or any other feelings that came out in your poem. You go first. Sorry? You go first. Sure. Um, I, I never did feel angry about disability. I'm, anger's probably an emotion that's not the easiest one for me to access, and I think that's probably true for a lot of women. Um, it was more insecure or less than. Those were the kinds of feelings that I, I had to work towards thinking differently about. Dan? Yeah, I would say I didn't have a lot of, uh, I certainly didn't have deep depression. Um, some flashes of anger, but I think for one thing it helped that I, I was born blind. I had an identical twin brother who was also blind. Um, and terrific parents. I think, I would say, in retrospect, um, if, I, if I had to point to some place where I, I can get angry, it, it's about the society which insisted um, to our parents that they would not be very well suited, not as capable of bringing up a blind person and teaching them, you know, simple things like how to make a bed, how to do various daily living skills. Of course, they couldn't have taught us Braille, but I did find out later that a few people, mostly middle class or above, who had parents with some sense of agency or resources or a way of thinking outside the box, were able to find a way for their children to get um, a public school education early on in the in the 50s and early 60s. Um, so I, I wish that uh, people had been more advanced, the society had been more advanced, and that's uh, probably where I was would be most upset. You heard a lot of the good things that came from being at the School for the Blind, but I actually uh, there are a lot of things, you know, being separated from my family. Um, there was a there was a, a certain amount of inhuman inhumane treatment by some of the house parents. Uh, so there were there were things that we were subjected to that might not have been entirely necessary. I'll add that um, I was I was mainstreamed my whole life, which overall was a wonderful thing, but what I lacked was um, having any friends or role models who looked and walked like me. Um, and I think that that's, that's where any negative feelings I had around it really came from, was that I didn't, I didn't see myself out in the world very much. I have a question. I have a question. Yes, we hear please. you. We can yeah. hear you fine. Were you often being teased, tormented because of your condition? Can you say that again? Were you often being bullied, tormented? Oh, okay. Were you often bullied or teased because of disability? Were, were you being bullied or? I, uh, I, not for, not, not as, not terribly much. I mean, there was, there was the girl, <laughs> walk, you know, walk like people who limp. But there was. You know, a couple of kids in junior high, but um, no, I, I feel very lucky that I was overall treated really well. You know, um, when I was in Julie, when, when I was in junior high, middle school, I was being bullied, tormenting to because of my. Dis I think your mic is off again. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I remember when I was in junior high, I was been bullied, tormented, teased because of my disability, and a lot of people don't know that I have autism spectrum. 
as when I reached the high school phase, it started when I was transferring to another high school, Sharpstown, which I graduated in 2004 for a special program. Because my previous high school, Westbury High School in Houston, doesn't offer that. And I was telling the special ed chair person the reason why I don't want to reach out is because some people were talking about me, mm -hmm. including a classmate, say that I was greeted, I, you know, beg. And then the, she said, if someone talks about you, just ignore them. Yeah. You're smart, you made better grades than that. And the, and this, the receptionist say that Miss Evans, who's now deceased, and she said, people talk about me all the time, she doesn't care, just ignore and walk away. And I was carrying the guilt that I was being bullied, teased, and my friends say, you're in high school, let it go. Don't worry about them, you know, they, somewhere else you're here. Was that helpful to you? Yes, because about what I found your story is inspiring to me. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. We have a question from our Palm Desert campus because we're live streaming down there. This will be our last question. We'll do closing remarks so we can go ahead and get started with the activity portion. So the question from the Palm Desert campus is, can you mention the name of the book about ABC? The oh, name of the book I about... I think it's Tangerines and Teas. Oh, my, my alphabet book? Yes. Um, it's called Tangerines and Tea, My Grandparents and Me. Um, and it was published by Harry and Abrams in uh, 2005, and it's illustrated by Yumi Hio. Well, thank you all so much for being here and for being such a great listening audience. It was really lovely. And thank you very much for your questions. It's really lovely to be here with you and we will be um, at a station in the activities area so if you didn't get to ask a question or you think of another one or you were too polite to be nosy in public uh, we'll hope that you'll come up and um, that's to remind me to collect my stuff uh, hope you'll come up and and please uh, spend some time with us we'd welcome that Excellent. So we did want to go ahead and thank our speakers for being here today. So if we can give them a round of applause. Also, we would like to present both um, Mr. Simpson and um, Ms. Gritz with a certificate of appreciation. So I'll go ahead and hand them to them now. And then I'll just, I'm gonna squeeze in with you and I'm gonna read it real quick. Yeah, in great. recognition of your outstanding support shown for CSUSB's Ability Awareness Event, the Office of Services to Students with Disabilities would like to offer their sincerest gratitude. This event would not have happened without your dedication and service. And it has your name, today's date, and then a couple of the logos um, of the people who helped us put this event together. Oh. So it's again, thank, thank you guys you so, so much. much for being here. One more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then we would invite everyone to head over to our activity portion. We're gonna have interactive stations. There's different departments um, and campus entities who are here to help support the event. And there'll also be free pizza. Um, your little raffle ticket, if you haven't submitted it yet, that gives you a chance for a raffle prize. We have a raffle box um, that's there where you can put it in for the prize that you'd like to attend. Thank you, thank you everyone.